Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in, it's David Summers, and here it is, another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. It's the story of wrestling in America, as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. Let's get back into the ring, let's get back into time, wall-to-wall, treetop tall, with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller in the great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. All right, so you've been into the low 30s, maybe not the upper 30s yet, right, Ron? No, no, thank goodness, not yet. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the 40s was pretty nice. Uh, you know, uh, as long as you didn't have to sleep outside, I guess it'd be okay. You know? <laughs> I don't know about the sleeping outside part of it. Uh, but, but, yeah, it's uh, it's been beautiful, man. Uh, and the leaves are... Just starting to turn a little yellow, man. So uh, it's it's uh, it's in the process now, man. Uh, and, and so is the big uh, pilgrimage to this part of the country, man, to see it. You know, we hit 49 one time, but I think that's as low as we've been. So it was a whole lot better to be outside. All right, listen, stud, we've arrived in this stud cast of decision. What you were going to do. With your two territory operation. That's easy for me to say. All right. So, in the last 30 or so stud cast, we've gone through almost 10 months in 1979 of real, I mean, real trials and tribulations. So, in this episode, number 320, we're going to find out what your future was, right? That's that's about time, I think, right, Dave? You know? (laughs) Yeah. It's been a long, hard ride, man, through 1979. And uh, I'm not only going to tell everyone today uh, what I decided to do after all these months, but uh, I'm even going to tell them why and how. And uh, and uh, and uh, so everything I'd planned uh, to happen to, uh, to me in the wrestling business since 1978, when we purchased the old Gulf Coast territory from the Fields Brothers, was uh, coming to an end, basically. And I don't know what to expect uh, from this point on. I didn't at that time. But it turned out, man, the future was so bright. As the old song goes, I had to wear shades. All right. And judging from the ride and the title of this studcast, number 320, this is number 320, choosing a territory, Hulk versus Ox, we're going to get more than just your decision on what to do with your Two terra two year actually two year two territory operation. That's correct, my man. Uh, there were there were no matches in Knoxville on this third week of October in 1979 because the TV station on on a very rare occasion didn't happen very often, but the show was preempted, and uh, they didn't do it very often because they had that 80 share show there. They didn't want to do it too often. So crowds there had been down anyway at this point, and without a TV show to advertise them, I decided to not run any live matches in Knoxville on that week. Hmm. So we'll still be covering the southeastern Gulf Coast territory, where actually the Hulk is going to be coming in to face Hawks Baker. Ah, cool deal. Okay, so I think you told us in number 320's title where we're going to be riding today, but maybe where first would be the proper question. Well, because there's no live wrestling event in Knoxville, Uh, at 31 years old, uh, we're we're going to begin with uh, uh, the most difficult decision in my young wrestling career and uh, discover which territory 
I was going to keep and which I was going to sell. So then we ride south into the Gulf Coast Territory for a brief return of the Hulk to face, like I said a minute ago, Ox Baker. And if we have enough time after all that, we'll do another learning tree question. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, but after all that, I, I'm not having a whole lot of faith about the learning tree question as to whether that's going to happen or not. But I do believe this will be one of the best stud cast ever. All right, so let's get right to it, Ron. Tell us why and how you made your decision about which territory you were going to sell and which one you're going to keep. Well, obviously, I spent a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, things were involved in this decision. Uh, the first was very sad for me. I was going to give up my two territory dream, and uh, and it had proven to be a much more difficult than I had anticipated it was ever going to be. So both territories in 1979 had experienced trouble. We've talked about that in the past studcast. The Gulf Coast began exactly uh, early in 1979 with a problem. And that stemmed from my father and his partner, Jerry Jarrett, in the Memphis Territory. And they made a controversial offer to my, my Gulf Coast booker, my brother Rob, to become their booker. And along with Rob, uh, I had sent a very strong crew from the Tennessee Territory into the Gulf Coast Territory before all this went down. So soon, most of the crew from my Tennessee Territory in the late 1978 also ended up going to Memphis when Rob went. So that trouble led to a dramatic drop in the Gulf Coast business until Rob's booker replacement, Louis Tillet, the guy that I found, and, uh, and, uh, and he, the Samoan tag team, uh, he brought in Austin Idol, and he brought in Ox Baker uh, after that. So then in June of 1979, the Tennessee Territory, which had experienced a much worse problem than the Gulf Coast Territory did, Four top wrestlers and the booker in Knoxville decided they want to start a wrestling award in hopes of getting me out of wrestling in the state of Tennessee. So that kind of brings us up to where we are today. In October of 1979, I made the decision to give up my two-territory dream and pick which of the two territories I wanted to keep. So, Dave, let's begin, man, with the keep. Uh, how, why did I make that decision? And so the Tennessee Territory was started first, obviously, in 1974, and it got off to a very slow start. But after the first year, that territory really took off, and, and it became what many wrestling historians believe was the most successful small territory in the world. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So the second territory, the Gulf Coast Territory, obviously, we cranked it up in 1978. It got off to a slow start as well. But uh, since that first summer of 1978, it had also become a very successful company. Uh, so to make my decision, I decided to start by comparing the buildings and their capacities in both territories. Seemed like a good place to start uh, to just see what the facilities were better. Uh, so the Tennessee Territory had two major markets, Knoxville and the Tri-Cities, which was Kingsport, Johnson City. Bristol, Tennessee, the Knoxville Coliseum, and the Chilhowee Park Amphitheater both had a capacity of around 6,000. We put more than that into both of them a couple of times, but uh, 6,000 was probably a uh, pretty full form. But if you got rain in the summertime when we were out there in the amphitheater outside, uh, you could lose an entire night. So you lose an event, you might lose two in the summer in one summer. So uh, <laughs> not such a good situation there. Mm. The building in the Tri-Cities area up there only held around 3,000 people. And uh, there was one other building in that uh, Tennessee Territory, Hazard, Kentucky, that had a building that held about 5,000. But all the other cities that we ran in that territory were high school gyms mostly, and uh, most of those gyms held between 2,000 and 3,000 people. So comparing that to the Gulf Coast buildings, you had Mobile with two buildings side by side. By, and uh, Expo Hall held about 5,000, but the larger one, the Municipal Auditorium, was well over 10,000. So both Montgomery and Dothan's buildings each held around 5,000, as did the Pensacola building. 
So smaller cities, we still ran in gymnasiums, sometimes in National Guard armories, uh, similar to the situation we had in the Tennessee Territory. So obviously the differences between the two territories when comparing the buildings and the size of the cities was pretty obvious. Tennessee had only two major markets that ran weekly, uh, Knoxville on Friday, uh, the Tri-City areas on Tuesday, and the other four nights we ran in just smaller towns. Uh, those were two major mar those two major markets only had about 200,000 total people living in those two cities, those two, those two areas. So if you compare that to the Gulf Coast area, uh, they had four major markets, all of which ran weekly uh, with a combined population of 400,000 living there. So you had twice the population. You had four major markets rather than two. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously you had twice the number of potential ticket buyers as you had in Tennessee. So I looked at the potential for expanding each territory uh, in the future, you know, as to which, which my, I may, if I kept, uh, which one I could uh, maybe work for me. So in Tennessee, I was surrounded by a lot of other wrestling companies. I had the Mid-Atlantic Territory and the Georgia Territories on the east and to the south of me. I had the Mid-American and the Memphis Territories to the west. Uh, and uh, they were also, uh, you know, to the north of me, obviously, Kentucky. So the Gulf Coast also had territories around it. Same situation, but the Gulf Coast Territory had other wrestling companies around it. But in further considering the Gulf Coast Territory, I was aware that Nick Goulas, promoter of Birmingham, along with my grandfather, they had been partners for many, many years, was getting up in age. My grandfather actually was died in 1980. So uh, Nick Goulas, uh, you know, he was he was an older fellow at this point, and uh, I knew that uh, this that city, Birmingham, along with the others that they ran in Alabama, had dropped dramatically in attendance in the last two years. Uh, Nick had not done very well, and I hadn't even spoken to my Gulf Coast about this that I was anticipating uh, and thinking about, but I but I knew I really felt like Nick Goulas was going to sell Birmingham to somebody. Uh, and, uh, and if you bought Birmingham, probably you would get the other Alabama cities as well. And I felt like that was going to happen in 1980. Mm -hmm. Birmingham was perfect to add to the Gulf Coast Territory. Mm -hmm. uh, it had Boutwell Auditorium, seated about 8,000 people. Uh, Huntsville, Alabama had a 10,000 plus arena. And uh, Florence and Sheffield in the northwest corner of Alabama at a 6,000 seat arena. So my thinking was, if, if we could buy Birmingham and get the rest of Alabama in the deal, we could add three more major markets to the three we already had with Pen and including Pensacola, mm. and it would give us a major city to run seven nights a week. Wow. If that happened, and if that happened, uh, in the entire southern United States, there was only one state one territory that could match that seven cities per week, and that was Florida Territory. Hmm. Okay. That's pretty amazing stuff, Stud. So what other criteria did you use to make your decision of which territory to hang on to? Well, the next thing I looked at was comparing the 1979 attendances in both territories. So let's start with the Tennessee Territory, and it had a very good opening. To the 1979 year. Uh, had a lot of great talent there. Uh, a lot of guys had gone south uh, into Tennessee, but there was still a great number of, uh, of uh, great wrestlers in the Knoxville area and the Tennessee area. And uh, But when this war started uh, in June of that year, uh, Knoxville's attendance dropped by 30%, you know, and, uh, and I didn't expect it to be that bad. Uh, I had never dealt with a wrestling war before, obviously. Uh, and it wasn't just the drop in the crowds that bothered me. It was what was being said and done uh, by the other company, by the Knoxville Five, on their TV and in their house shows. And that made me realize what they were doing now at this point uh, was going to set wrestling in that part of the country back even further than when it was what it was when I arrived there in 1974. So in the attendance comparison, the Gulf Coast Territory 
had an up and down year, depending on who was booking and how good the talent was. But when the Hulk and the Samoans and Idol and Crusher Blackwell went down there and Ox was there, uh, that territory set two significant records, uh, 8,000 in one night to watch uh, Hulk and Harley in the Dothan football stadium and over 10,000 in Mobile's main arena. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, uh, so in the last five weeks, uh, before, you know, of Studcast that we have been doing in the last five weeks, basically from September through the first week of October, uh, I went down there and started booking, uh, in the Gulf coast territory and the three major markets down there, their weekly total had rose from 7,600 fans to 12,400 in five weeks. And in that same five weeks, Knoxville crowds had dropped from 4,200 in the first uh, crowd that, uh, uh, that had Andre down to 2,700 in the last one. Wow. All right. Some pretty amazing figures, Ron. Obviously, you took a deep dive into the numbers and money calculations of the differences in the two territories. So what else did you consider before making your decision on choosing the territory that you wanted to keep? Well, my, at this point, it was my potential buyers. If I'm going to sell one of them, you know, uh, uh, who, who is a likely candidate to buy? And uh, that was obviously my next thing and my next thoughts. And 1979, let's just go back and talk about the year of 1979. And uh, it was a very difficult time for all Americans. Uh, it was the last year of Jimmy Carter's presidency. The country was in bad shape. Iran was still holding our embassy people hostage. I mean, there was a horrible inflation problem uh, that had persisted for all four years, basically, of Carter's presidency. Mm-hmm. And the borrowing rate for loans was extremely high, kind of like... And, uh, and I felt like that was one of the reasons that Nick Goulas's business that I spoke of earlier had been so bad, you know, uh, because 79 was tough. Uh, remarkably, we had, Southeastern had done very well during those years, but there was not a lot of promoters or owners of wrestling companies around the country, uh, that, uh, that did well. And, and there were many, uh, Obviously, there weren't going to be many of them looking to buy in an economic situation like that. Yeah, no, I can certainly see that. So it sounds like you didn't leave out a single calculation of what to look at. I mean, I think you had all the bases covered in the in the process. So who did you think was the best possibility uh, as far as a buyer goes? Well, after a lot of thought and uh uh, it, it basically came down to one person, you know, uh, this guy had the money, uh, he was looking to expand. Uh, he was actually expanding during that time frame, And, uh, and, uh, I, and, and I knew that he might be interested. Uh, he was in Atlanta, which was very close and he had dealt with how to end a wrestling war, <laughs> very similar to what I was dealing with in the Tennessee territory. Uh, and he was a giant in American wrestling history before he decided to leave the country and take his American style, the American style of wrestling, to Australia. There he became an even more wealthy man. In 1974, he returned to America from Australia, and he picked Atlanta as the territory to buy that he wanted to go to Georgia. And the Atlanta war was still going on. And that fact didn't bother him. You know, in fact... He ended one of the longest running wrestling wars in history. So three years, that, that war went for three years from 1972 to 1974. And he wasn't even there when the war started, but he knew how to end one. He did so, and, uh, and he bought, what he did is he bought out both sides that had been fighting for years, and he made Atlanta wrestling stronger than ever. Wow. So this has really been fascinating, Stud. Are you ready to tell us which territory you decided to keep in October of 1979? Well, first, I guess I need to say the guy's name that I talked about there. Yeah. uh, This was Jim Barnett. I mean, most people know Barnett's history. 
And uh, he was one of the most uh, successful wrestling promoters and owners in the history of the sport for 40 years, you know. So uh, uh, and this guy's very close. Uh, it was perfect, you know. So, uh, so it was an agonizing process, uh, you know, uh, and a, an agonizing decision as well. One that I was going to, to, to was, was going to take me away from a part of the country that I had become uh, so, <laughs> so loving of. I mean, it was really, really hard. And in spite of everything, I made the decision to sell my Tennessee territory and to keep the territory my father had built 25 years earlier, uh, the old Gulf Coast Territory. So... How soon did you move on the decision after you made it? Well, gee, you'd say for, uh, pra- immediately, I would say. <laughs> you know? and, and in fact, uh, today is October 11th, 2023. It's in this studcast, uh, number 320 today. And, uh, and, so, and so this is amazing. Exactly 49 years ago today, on October 11th, 1974, I was wrestling in Knoxville. For the first time ever, as a heel for the first time ever, against Dennis Hall. Wow. And I was there that day to finalize the deal to buy Knoxville from the present owner, John Kazana, and I gave him $25,000 down payment, October 11, 19, 1974. Okay, you got to be kidding, Ron. It's an amazing, a really amazing coincidence, October 11th. Must be a pretty special day for you, is it? Actually, Dave, uh, I'm actually not done, man. Uh, <laughs> there was an even bigger coincidence to this October 11th date. Uh, after that October 11, 1974, first match in Knoxville, where I closed the deal to buy Knoxville, exactly five years later, on October 11, 1979, I was on the phone with Jim Barnett. You were asking him, well, how long did it take me to do to make the deal, I was on the phone October 11, 1979, offering to sell the Southeastern Territory uh, to Jim Barnett for exactly the same price I had paid for it, $150,000. Wow. Okay. So w- what did he say? <laughs> without hesitation. I mean, and literally without hesitation, he said yes. Oh. <laughs> and he also said he'd like to cut in Fred Ward for a piece of it. Hmm. Now, Fred was a promoter I knew very well from my first year in the sport. I started wrestling in Georgia to begin with. And uh, Fred Ward, I used to wrestle hmm. for him, me and my brother, in Columbus, Georgia, and Macon, Georgia. He owned those two towns. Hmm. So basically, we made the deal uh, on that day for Barnett to buy the territory. Wow, this is getting, uh, may I say, freaky, Ron. So let me get this straight. You're saying that on October 11th, 1974, the day of your first match in Knoxville and the day you finalized the deal to buy Knoxville, you paid the down payment that on October 11th, 1979, exactly five years later that you made a up for sale to Jim Barnett and you made a deal with him that day. Amazing. <laughs> I'll tell you, right? October 11th. I don't know why that's happened. And it's really amazing that today we are talking about it. And it's exactly 49 years ago when that that uh, first trip to Knoxville was made. So you got it right, Dave. Uh, I went to work, man, uh, immediately at this point. And uh, I called my four partners, Bob, uh, Rob, Jimmy, and Roy. Uh, and they were my partners in the Gulf Coast Territory. And I informed them that I was going to sell Knoxville. I told them to, to be quiet about it until I gave the okay and uh, not to talk about it. So they were extremely happy to hear about it, you know, because they had been dealing with it too, back and forth from territory to territory and all the things that were going on in the year. So I told them that from here on out, Southeastern Gulf Coast and Pensacola was going to be our home. And I guaranteed them that we would all be down there working. And as far as I was concerned, I told them they could start looking for houses and uh, make a home there for the foreseeable future. Now, I knew uh, we were going to need some new talent as soon as possible. 
uh, my replacing Louie and, uh, and taking the book away from him, it, all, it, it had already caused some of the, his crew that he had brought in down there to, to give a notice to me. So I began to work in my book uh, to see who I could find a, and get down there first. And also got in touch with Barnett. Uh, we got the, the sale contract started. Uh, we set a date for closing it. Uh, we had an agreement uh, for a starting date in which he, he would, his operation would take over the new territory. Uh, Jim wanted to keep the southeastern name for the territory for the time being and not let anybody know about this until he was ready. Obviously, I told him I'd already talked to my partners and uh, I told him to be quiet. And uh, so we talked about many, many other things, obviously, uh, every day for, for probably a week there at least. And uh, it was easy for me to work with Jim. I had wrestled for him twice in Australia, 1971, and then again in 19, uh, and respectful of my father. They were great friends and had been for years. So uh, I have uh, one last one last card uh, that I want to talk about. Uh, uh, we kind of ended that. Uh, everybody knows where we're at at this point. I had sold out. Uh, Rob and them knew we were all going to Pensacola. We were going to make that territory big. and. Uh, so I have one last card here of, uh, for the Allstate guys, the, the Knoxville Five. <laughs> and uh, this card was on Saturday, October 20th, 1979. That was the day after we skipped running on our regular night. So, uh, And that fact alone, it gave them obviously a much better night than they had had if they got to running because we weren't running against them. Uh, so uh, fans that couldn't go to our matches – a lot of them went to their matches, Some, for a lot of them probably for the first time. And uh, so uh, so they were in that same WNOX auditorium. Uh, the card was a double main event. And I don't know who was in the first match, but in the second match was the ladies' match. It was a, a wrestler named Satin, who I'm really not familiar with, wrestling against Debbie Combs, uh, which was pretty popular, a uh, well-known lady wrestler. Third match was an elimination tag match, the Assassin and the Great Malenko versus Bob Roop and Pez, Pistol Pez Wadley. The first main event uh, was the Texas Death Match with Terry Gibbs versus Barry Orton. And then the last match was for the Southern title, Ronnie Garvin versus Bob Orton Jr. again. Mm. Obviously, a lot of these guys are wrestling each other again and again, week after week. <laughs> All right, so after all that, how did they do attendance-wise? Well, as I said earlier, it was better than usual because we didn't run the night before. So my weekly spotter, the guy that uh, was uh, going every week and trying to give me an idea of what the crowd looked like, he said it was the best crowd yet for them. He, he, he guessed that it was probably maybe as many as 1,200. So before we leave this subject today, Dave, uh, I'd like to pay my respect to the last group of wrestlers that were in uh, both the southeastern territories before I sold it. And, and I would like to list the names, uh, basically to honor all the great stars that we had uh, during the end of this, uh, this unique NWA southeastern era that, that we had for five years, basically. In the, in the southeastern Tennessee territory, we had the Mongolian Stomper, we had Alexis Smirnoff, we had Dick Slater. We had Paul, my brother Robert. We had my cousin Jimmy. We had Norval Austin. We had Tony Charles. We had David Schultz, Dean Ho, the angel Frank Morrell, gorgeous George Jr. And in the last few weeks before I decided to do this, we had had Andre the Giant, Bob Armstrong, Frisco added to that group. And then down in the southeastern Gulf Coast Territory, we had Ox Baker. We had Austin Idol, we had Kevin Sullivan, we had the Assassins, we had Jerry Stubbs, Mike Stallings, the Gladiator, Dick Steinborn, Rock Hunter, Eddie Mansfield, Roy Lee Welch, Herb Calvert, and the Inferno and myself. <laughs> and in the last few weeks, uh, you know, down in that area, we had had the Samoans, we had Crusher Blackwell, and, and this uh, studcast, we've got coming back. Uh, returning to Hulk. <laughs> so basically, you know, uh, Dave, that was 33 wrestlers 
in, 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 in two territories, mm -hmm. but uh, under the employment of Southeastern were 33 wrestlers. Many of those guys were some of the best wrestlers in the world. Yeah. Undoubtedly, you know, and a few, and few, if any other territory could match that total number of wrestlers and the quality of those guys. Wow. So basically, Southeastern had earned a spot for itself as one of the best territories ever. Yeah, and after the way you built Knoxville, as you did and as it evolved over the years, that's amazing that you're saying that now about what was really your newest territory. So, all right, so far, this has absolutely been historic, Stud, and this stud cast is, I think, going to be a big one. I've been blown away by pretty much everything that you've told us today. So now we are definitely changing gears, heading south, where the Hulk was making a short return to the beaches of Pensacola and the Gulf Coast Territory. So that happens when we come back after the break on this stud cast. All right, there is still time to get your question to the stud for the Ask the Stud number 10 question and answer show exclusively on YouTube Southeastern Rewind, Saturday, October 21st, 2023. All you need to do is go to any of Ron's three Facebook sites, find his Ask the Stud 10 post, and leave your question there. If you're not friends with him on Facebook, simply go to Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud, like and follow him there, and you're automatically friends with a living legend. If you want to leave your question on X Twitter, find his Ask the Stud 10 post. Leave your question there and join him on Saturday, October 21st, 2023. All right, Studcast fans, welcome back in the second half of this, what is, I think, going to be a historic Studcast. All right, Stud, so we're now down in the Gulf Coast Territory and awaiting a visit from the Hulk. So explain to us how this all came about. I think you maybe you got a phone call at some point. Yeah, you know, it, it was actually pretty simple, Dave. You know, he, uh, he, after he left uh, Southeastern in August of 1979, uh, you know, he went down to Memphis. And, uh, you know, uh, and he had only been there for about three months and was headed back uh, to go to work for Jim Barnett, the guy that we just talked about a second ago. Uh, and he was going to go to work for him in the Georgia Territory. So, uh, you know, and uh, so Terry Bolio, real name, uh, so-called Oak, he called me up out of the blue and he said he was coming to stay on Pensacola Beach for a week. Uh, he, I guess he was going to spend and take some time off after uh, being in Memphis. And he said, you know, before he goes into, he said, I'm going into the Georgia Territory, Ron, but I'm going to stay on the Pensacola Beach for a week. And he goes, uh, if you'd like to book me for a couple of days, you know, I'll be willing to work, you know. So uh, that that offer turned into five days. <laughs> so it started on TV <laughs> in Dothan on Saturday, October 13th, 1979. Hmm. Then uh, on Sunday, he worked in Pensacola. On Monday, he worked in Montgomery. On Wednesday, he worked in Mobile. And then he finished on Friday night, October 19th, <laughs> 1979. All right, so you didn't take advantage of him uh, maybe a little bit, did you, Ron? <laughs> well, you know, I don't think so in a way, Dave. You know, right. he was young, and he needed matches, man, to keep improving himself. You know, so besides, you know, he kind of owed, owed it to me. And, and he said so himself in the conversation we had because of the way he left without a notice that night that uh, we had the big 8,000 crowd in the Dothan football stadium where he wrestled Harley Race. He disappeared. No notice. Wow. Okay, so I've, I kind of forgot. I guess he did owe you. So what was on the card in Mobile, Montgomery, and even Dothan the week beginning on Sunday, October 14th, 1979. Well, it was a triple main event card. Uh, the wrestling pro, Tarzan Baxter, wrestled against Eddie Mansfield. Roy Lee Welch took on the hunter, rock hunter, I'm talking about. Uh, then in the first main event, it was a Southeastern Tag Championship match. The champion assassins defended against Jerry Stubbs. And uh, my, my brother it was returning to the Gulf Coast right away. He had, we as soon as I notified him of uh, what we were doing, I was going to do with uh, Knoxville, he was the first guy to go there. And uh, so he was being sent down there. 
He hadn't been down there in nine months since he took the job in Memphis. So then the second main event featured the new Southeastern champion, Kevin Sullivan, against the former champion, Austin Idol. And not only was the belt at stake in this match, but the loser had to leave. So uh, then in the final match, uh, uh, it was a very special challenge match is what we called it, and that's exactly what it was. Ox Baker was going to be against the mystery man. And the match was uh, also a loser leave Southeastern match. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a pretty good card. So Robert returning to partner with Jerry Stubbs in a tag title match. That's pretty epic in and of itself. Then back-to-back loser leaves matches. Kevin Sullivan, the new Southeastern champion, defending for the first time against the former champion, Austin Idol, with everything at stake, including the title, and the loser leaves. Okay, but that last match, Stud, Ox Baker versus the Mystery Man with the loser leaves Southeastern is truly a mystery to me up to now. Well, that's, that's understandable. You know, he's a mystery man. But it wouldn't be long, Dave, uh, before the fans have got to see the TV show that promoted this card. So uh, let's just go right into that TV show. TV opened with Charlie Pat, uh, and he was running down the TV card. And uh, and uh, and right away interrupted by Ox Baker, who uh, you know Ox kind of did what he wanted to, and uh, Ox went to the set and he was very upset, uh, and he had just found out he was wrestling in the loser leave Southeastern match the following week, and uh, he had no idea who he was wrestling. Right? <laughs> he, he said it just <laughs> says the mystery man. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, what kind of deal is this, <laughs> right? So. Uh, so Ox said, you know, uh, you know, he said, uh, you know, Charlie Platt, I, I'm sure I know who it is, you know, uh, since I've wrestled him every week for the last month, uh, you know, it's it's Ron Fuller, you know, and he and then he, he bragged <laughs> about beating and humiliating me the last time we wrestled in an I quit match where he made me say I quit over the building's public address system. And, uh, and he said at the same time, I almost broke his arm in the process, Charlie Platt. And uh, and then he asked uh, Charlie point blank. He said, uh, "Who who am I wrestling in this loser leave Southeastern match?" So Charlie told him, uh, you know, uh, that he had no idea, and you know that uh, that he might be, uh, you know, he might be able to find that out to answer that question during this TV show. He just hang in there, you know. So Baker went away from the set, uh, grumbling, and uh, still in the Southeastern champion assassins joined Charlie when he left, and they were complaining. They had their own complaints about how the Southeastern Wrestling Company seemed to be so focused on getting rid of great wrestlers, you know, like themselves. And, you know, like Ox Baker and um, Austin Idol, who are both in loser lead matches here, you know. I mean, what's going on here, right? And, uh, you know, they were upset, you know, about, uh, you know, the upcoming week, uh, you know, uh, how their buddies could be leaving town here. I mean, uh, uh, this is crazy what's happening here. Now Ox Baker doesn't even know who he's wrestling, and it's a loser leave. You know, and uh, so then they watched the video, and uh, it was a victory over Jerry Stubbs and the Wrestling Pro from three days or um, Expo Hall. And the video showed them obviously punishing the Wrestling Pro at the end of it before they basically finally pinned him. Mm. And uh, then they challenged Jerry Stubbs right there. The Jerry, you need to get yourself another partner. Mike Stallings didn't get the job done. <laughs> the wrestling pro ain't going to get the job done, they were saying. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, and then uh, they had a big laugh and went to the ring, and they said, we're going to show you how to get the job done, Charlie Platt. <laughs> no, they went in and got themselves a big win. All right, so it sounds like the heels were very upset early in the show about Southeastern hiding their opponents' names and having so many loser leaves matches. So how do you follow that? What was up next? Well, Ox Baker returned to the set. You know? and, he, and he's even more upset than he was the first time he came there. And, he, and, he, you know, and then he told Charlie, he said, you know, I figured out who the mystery man is. And he says, if it isn't Ron Fuller, it's got to be Fuller's best friend, Bob Armstrong, isn't it? 
you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and he, he, he said, that's who it is, right, Charlie? You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> somebody tell me something here, basically, you know, and Charlie said again, I have no idea who it is, Ox, you know, and uh, <laughs> so then Baker stormed away from the set again, Manny shaking his head and talking to himself. So uh, Jerry Stubbs came to the set. Uh, just uh, as soon as Ox was walking away, and uh, and he commented about the assassins, you know, uh, about the, what the assassins had said earlier about him needing to find a new partner, and uh, and he told Charlie that uh, that he had <laughs> that he had done that, you know, uh, and his new partner was here today, going to be with him today, and he said uh, my new partner is somebody that I grew up just down the road from. Uh, you know, we didn't live very far apart. We played uh, in sports against each other in high school. And he says, uh, Charlie, this partner, he's no stranger to winning championships. So Charlie asked, well, who are you talking about, Jerry? Mm -hmm. And Jerry said, well, let's just bring him out. So, uh, you know, fans had no idea who to expect. And, uh, man, the crowd, uh, the studio popped. Robert came out. They hadn't seen him in nine months. They exploded. So, uh, you know, Rob said hello to Charlie and then uh, all the fans. And then and then he basically said, you know, Jerry, uh, do the talking for us, man. And, uh, well, I watched that match. So they were very, very impressive, man, for, for a first-time team and a studio audience, man. They let them know how much they enjoyed it, too. Oh, uh, that's a cool deal. All right, so was it time for the personnel? And uh, when I joined Charlie at the, at the profile set, and we were doing it live uh, right next to the bleachers, and uh, Charlie Bear had time to introduce me before Ox Baker. Here he comes again. He exploded out. Of the oh, I told you, Charlie Platt, it's Ron Fuller. I knew it was. That's the mystery man, you know. He's the guy I'm going to be wrestling in the loser leave match, you know. And, uh, and he didn't come all the way to the set. He stopped right at the edge of the ring. You know, he got his saying in that, you know, he's the guy I see now what's happening. And, uh, you know, the crowd started booing him right away. And so I yelled that since he was already yelling. And I yelled at him, no, Ox, you're wrong. Uh, you know, yeah, I wanted the match. and But the Southeastern officials said no uh, because we had been out, wrestled each other for four weeks in a row. And I, I said, but yes. So Baker went nuts. So he mean, what do you mean? You you picked my opponent? It's got to be Bob Armstrong, you know. And I said, no, it isn't Bob Armstrong either. And then uh, <laughs> I was getting a little perturbed with him. And I said, uh, you know, uh, would you like to see who it is? And he screamed, yes, because I have every <laughs> right to see who it is. <laughs> and so, uh. There was a guy that you know, had the big overhead door in the back of the studio there, the yeah. steel door. Yeah. And uh, there was a guy that I had set back there in case we got to this point. And I signaled for the guy back there, uh, and he, he started lifting the huge overhead steel door in the back of the studio. Everybody, you know, door rose slowly, and, uh, and then a forklift rolled into the studio. Had a giant cardboard box on it. It had the word mystery man on all four sides of the box. <laughs> and so so and the, the fans, they were, they had been screaming, man. They, they had at him. And, uh, you know, so Baker's mouth dropped open. Uh, they got a great shot. The camera guy's got a great shot. His mouth, like, what in the heck is this? And he shouted to me, he goes, who's in the box? <laughs> and I said, well, well, why don't you go over there, box? And to find out for yourself. <laughs> and, and he shook his head, no. You know, and he screamed, uh, you tell me. You tell me. I, and I said, well, okay, Box, I said, you can either go over there and find out for yourself, or you can wait till next week and find out in the arena. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the studio crowd had been booing him, basically since he came out of the dressing room. And, uh, and it was getting to him, and so he covered his ears with his hands, and he screamed at the crowd to shut up. And then he walked over to the box, and uh, and he was real cautious, man. And, he, and then he finally, it, it had a big cardboard lid on the top of it. He finally got hold of the of the cardboard lid, and he lifted it up. And uh, you know, when he did the studio island, they 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 just went silent, like they were like, "He was what? Who is in there?" You know. Mm -hmm. 
And then, then, and then he kind of stepped up to the edge of the box, and he, he's pretty tall. He peeked over and uh, to see what was inside. And these two giant arms came out, and they drug him over into the box. <laughs> and the box just exploded, boy. They <laughs> went fighting in the box. Wow. And it exploded. And uh, all of a sudden, there was the Hulk standing right over the top of box. Baker, man. Baker was laying flat on his back <laughs> in that box. <laughs> And that place went nuts. That studio just that they went crazy. Nobody expected the Hulk out of all people, right? So then the two of them, uh, they fought their way back to Ox's dressing room. And he finally disappeared into the dressing room. And the Hulk uh, faced the fans in the bleachers. And he gave them one of those big trap shots where he pumped up his traps. And, you know, and then they popped again. And uh, then he came to the profile set. Me and Charlie still sitting there on the profile set. And um, so with the studio uh, at this point, they were on fire, man. And uh, so he told Charlie, you know, uh, he was back. And he said, I'm only here for one reason. He goes, I came here because Ron asked me if I'd like to run box Ox Baker out of Southeastern Wrestling. <laughs> and uh, so I got up from the set and I raised his hand and I hugged him and I I told Charlie, man, Charlie, I can't wait to see this match. <laughs> and, uh, me and the Hulk went to the dressing room. Wow. All right. So that's a wild story. It had to be one of the biggest moments in Southeastern TV history. I love those moments. All right. So how did you follow that? Well, it wasn't easy, Dave. You know, I mean, uh, that's pretty big. Uh, but Kevin Sullivan, who was the new Southeastern champion, he wore his belt into the ring and, uh, and Kevin was smart, man. He rode that wave of excitement from the personality profile. Fans were all up, and he just he tore into uh, the Inferno, who was wrestling him, and uh, who was a pretty good wrestler. And uh, obviously, he made pretty quick work of him. And uh, then he made an interview after the match talking about his upcoming championship and loser leave match with Austin Idol. And uh, then he turned the interview over to the Hulk, who had – um, when Kevin started his interview, Hulk kind of joined him. And, uh, I, boy, it was really obvious to me, man, and I'm sure to all those fans in the, stu in the studio and at home that the Hulk had learned to talk, man. And he he turned that piece of an interview, uh, wow, <laughs> into a – it was unbelievable. He tore the studio up, man. Uh, for the second time that day, he had torn him up already, and then he tore him up with the interview. Then uh, Austin Idol uh, closed out the TV show. Uh, he got himself a win. Then he had a short interview about getting his belt back. He was going to get his belt back from Kevin Sullivan. He was going to send Kevin Sullivan back to Boston. And uh, then he kind of turned it over to Ox Baker. And Ox was all business on the last of the show, man saying he wasn't through in Southeastern. Nobody's running me anywhere. He said, I'm going to turn the hulk into a hunk of dead body with my heart punch. <laughs> wow. All right. That is a fantastic TV show, Ron. So what happened in the buildings the next week? Well, Eddie Mansfield beat the wrestling pro. Roy Lee Welch uh, got a win over Hunter, uh, Rock Hunter that was. In the first uh, main event, the Assassins got themselves intentionally disqualified in their championship match, uh, intentionally saved their belts when Robert got his fuller leg lock on one of them, and uh, the other one had to save him, knock down the referee, did whatever he had to do to get them disqualified. Then in the first of the two loser leave matches, Kevin Sullivan saved his belt, and he sent Austin Idol packing, man. It was Idol's first Southeastern run, and it had lasted six months. And he had given me his notice two weeks earlier based upon my fire in Louis Tillet. And, uh, and then admitted to me on his last night uh, that he was there in the territory, that he had made a mistake. And, that, uh, and you know, uh, and we had been friends for many, many years, spent time together in Australia and everywhere else. And, and uh, so... Austin Idol was going to return many times, man, over the next seven years. Uh, he, and he, he was going to become a permanent resident in Pensacola, Florida. He's going to make his home there, you know. And uh, before his days were through in that seven years, 
he wasn't going to work for me just in Southeastern, but he was going to work for me in Continental and then in USA Wrestling as well. So then the, the Hulk did a, a great job in the last match of getting Ox Baker over, which is hard to do because Ox was hard to work with. And uh, so Hulk lost all the matches in the course of the week uh, and left the Southeastern Gulf Coast uh, territory uh, for the second time. And for the last time ever, he never came back to work for Southeastern. Uh, and he was going to show up uh, three weeks later on Jim Barnett and Fred Ward's first Southeastern Tennessee show once they start to run Knoxville. Uh, Oxbaker uh, would have one more week in the Southeastern Gulf Coast. And then several more after that, he would go and end up in the Southeastern Tennessee uh, territory uh, work before earning himself actually a spot to work for Jim Barnett in the Georgia Territory. Mm. All right. How about attendances for the three major markets on that week? Well, Montgomery had 3,600 that week compared to 3,500 the week before. Mobile had a sellout at 5,000. And Dothan was pretty close to a sellout. It went from 4,200 to 4,500. So the three city total was up another 700 fans from where it was the week before. At this point, it had gone from 7,400 in six weeks to over 13,000 in, in, in those three shows, 13,000 fans in those three shows. Wow. All right. I'm sorry, but I don't think we're going to have time for another learning tree question today. Hopefully, we're going to get one next, Studcast. This has been a really terrific ride today, Stud. So much unique wrestling history from both territories. So much information about lots of wrestlers in particular, and an awesome explanation of how you made that difficult decision of which territory you were going to keep. So where are we riding next week, Stud? Well, we'll be covering the last week in October 1979. Uh, it's going to be just two weeks from this point uh, before Jim Barnett and Fred Ward take over the territory, and I give the story of the tale to the Knoxville newspaper. Going to be talking to the newspaper first time ever that they're going to know from me that I was the guy behind Southeastern Wrestling. Uh, there was a lot of things going on during the exchange of the territory, obviously, as it is in all all wrestling uh, situations. And I'll be doing my best to, to give as many of those things that uh, that were happening as possible to to our listeners. Uh, then uh, the sad times were upon us at this point, upon me in particular. A tour of Tanaka had already worked his last show in Knoxville for me. Uh, thankfully, he was going south. Uh, he was going to be one of the guys going to the Gulf Coast Territory. Uh, the next stud cast is going to be the next to the last uh, Tennessee show that I would run until six years later in 1985. Pretty amazing. He thought that I'd never be back. And it was going to be six years before I ever came back. Uh, the next TV show would be on Friday, October 26, 1979. Uh, the next actual card, live event, is going to be in the Knoxville Coliseum. We'll be talking about that event next week. It was going to be the last show for the Mongolian Stomper, for Alexis Smirnoff, for Dean Ho, and Redbeard Doug Gilbert. Uh, Stomper was going to be going south to the Gulf Coast. And I got to be honest, I don't know where the other three of those guys went. It was also going to be, this next card, the first week for some new Georgia talent. Uh, and that's going to be David Schultz and Dennis Condry and a guy named Pierre Lefevre. And uh, good news for the Gulf Coast fans, uh, there's going to be a tremendous influx of talent going down there. Bob Armstrong was going to be arriving to face and uh, another loser leave match uh, for Ox Baker. And uh, this time, Ox not going to be very lucky. And there was going to be a temporary drop in attendance there because so many changes were being made by all this uh, that was going on mm -hmm. that uh, by 1980, though, we, we were all going to be happy, man, about the decision I had made in this stud, uh, this stud cast cool deal okay i could be wrong but i don't remember a stud cast that was as filled with information as this one no doubt so after hearing what is coming next week 
I'm going to have to rest up for the for the next week, I think. So that would be good for me. Just remain still and calm for a full week. I think I can. I think I can. All right. You're on a roll, Ron. This continuing life story of yours just gets better and better. And folks, you know the deal. On Facebook, go to Ron Fuller Welch, the Tennessee stud on Facebook. Like and follow him there to become friends with a living legend. Same thing on Twitter, now known as X. Find Ron on Twitter, X, at Ron Fuller Welch and follow him there as well. Check out the fantastic website. It's tnstud.com. tnstud.com. This stud cast will be there. It's definitely going to be there with every stud cast ever done. Now 320 of them will be there. Find the stud store where you can get 43 super stud cast t-shirts, four different eight by 10 photos and the thrilling lion novel called Brutus. Get yours personally autographed. Get a copy there today. Subscribe now at YouTube Southeastern rewind and get the best in old school wrestling. Go to YouTube And then in the search bar, put in Southeastern Rewind. Boom, it pops right up. Find 347 videos, the last 97 stud cast, 52 stud stories, 74 short rides with the stud, nine ask the stud question and answer shows with number 10 coming Saturday, October 21st of 23. That's YouTube Southeastern Rewind, the best in old school wrestling. All right. Any final comments, Stud? Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed this Studcast. Uh, you know, I worked uh, pretty hard on this one because it's 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 a different uh, different subject matter entirely, and uh, and I appreciate uh, everybody's continued support out there. Please tell your friends and neighbors about us, and take care of yourselves and others, and may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic studcast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee Stud. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.